All right, we got the... Uh, yeah, we're in business. Now, this is a, a picture that I quite like because it's the way a lot of brands will approach China, even when they're localising for China. They'll view every consumer that kind of as the same. They all kind of look the same. They all have the same tastes. But obviously, even in a market like New Zealand, we're a little bit diverse. But everything is incredibly diverse across China. I'm going to start off just with a, a personal question. And um, who here owns a Porsche? There's a few hands. I'm awfully envious. I've always loved a Porsche. But if, if we look to the other side of the Pacific, uh, I, was, I remember as a... When I first finished university, I went over and lived in North America. I couldn't believe how many Porsches are on the road. And, and a boy that grew up with a Commodore, it was, it was pretty great to see all these fast cars. And since spending a little bit of time in America and, and reflecting back, uh, I really understood who's buying those Porsches. And I think the general process that happens is people will study incredibly hard of that Porsche demographic. will go to university, they'll get their master's, They'll work for the man, put their kids through college, and then around 50, they'll have a midlife crisis and they'll buy a Porsche or a Harley. But, but if you look at the Porsche drivers, they aren't the cool kids with the cool gears. They're the grey-haired accountants, corporate workers and stuff. Sorry, I'm sure, that, uh, the, the guys that stuck up their hand exclude. Cross the Pacific uh, to a country called China, and does anyone want to guess the average age of a Porsche owner in China? 25, if only. It's about 35, so about 15, 17 years younger than, than those in America. But I think what it reflects is, or what it represents, is just how these young consumers in China are the consumers that are the ones buying New Zealand premium products that are coming here on holiday and really engaging with, with the regions and things. Um, if you talk about New Zealand, baby boomers are a phenomenal market. These guys have a lot of home equity and, and they've retired. Kids have left home, in many cases wanting support and wanting home deposits and things, but they are the ones with the cash. They're the ones that you, you're probably going to do pretty well marketing to. In China, the complete opposite. You've got these young'uns, the millennials, that are the consumers that are most likely to buy our products. And that's with good reason. If you look at, and I'm sorry it's tiny... But if you look at the average income of America, New Zealand, most countries in the world, the older you are, the more income you earn. So that's the blue chart. Um, obviously, straight out of school, you're going to not earn as much. But as you get older, you get more experience. And then there's a bit of a dip when you hit 55. You don't know about things like social media and e-commerce and all these things that are apparently relevant. You look at China, it is flipped up the other way. You've got the highest earning income group is 18 to 29. And then it drops down. And it's just, it's going to shift as Chinese grow um, more mature as a market. But right now, these young'uns are the ones earning the highest official income. So the average person born in the 90s in China is seven times more likely to have a university degree than someone born in the 70s. They're also, if you look at the, the highest paid industry, tech, like in many countries, 70% of all tech workers in China are aged under 30. So these guys are earning significantly more, but they're also much more open-minded. And here's something, it's by a company called Pew Research, it's not skinny research, but they measure soft power, and they look at how Chinese view America. Is it good, is it bad? And they found, this was pre-trade war, so I'm sorry, it's probably changed a little bit, but most, the majority of, around 60% of young'uns under 30s view America positively. Whereas you get the crusty, grumpy old people, that's only 30%. Most of them don't view West and America, but by proxy West, Western lifestyles, cultures, products, as positively as our younger friends. They're also much more likely to travel. And we find that, that tourism has, is, it's great obviously for the hotels and the airports and the, and the souvenir shops, but we've found that it, it has a, a really positive effect on, on a lot of different industry. And at the Skinny, we've done a lot of work with Tourism Australia, and we evaluate people that haven't been to Australia versus those that have. And we looked at the perception of food and beverage. And it went from 27% overall in China, those that visited Australia, 
it goes up to 69%. So they, they go there much, much like as a Kiwi, if you go to China, you eat Sichuan peppers, you eat dumplings, and you're probably going to have more of an affinity with those products when you come back. Same with Chinese coming here. So tourism is, is a very good enabler for all these other products. And tourism, two-thirds of Chinese travellers are, are born after 1980. The two-thirds of all passport holders are born after 1980. So again, open-minded, uh, much more um, pro-Western lifestyles, still very nationalistic, very pro-Chinese um, and very proud of, of where China's come, become, but also much more open to foreign cultures and products. And obviously something you hear a lot in relation to China is digital. China is an incredibly digital savvy country, but not the whole country. There's an awful lot of people that still don't have a smartphone in China. But of that young population, 90% of them uh, uh, have, a, have a digital, have a smartphone and use them much more than any other group in, in the world, pretty much. So it's not really fair to compare Chinese, um, to generalise Chinese consumers, but something, and China Skinny's done research and with tens of thousands of consumers across China, and we find there's some themes that come through. And just like we talk about Gen Y and Gen X and Gen Z and, or Gen Z in New Zealand, um, in China the most common segmentation are post-80s, post-90s, post-95s, etc., so we've found that there's some similarities in these different groups um, that, that really bring them together. So post-80s, most of these consumers have grown up in a China. They've seen China go from quite a humble place to the incredibly shiny, fast trains, tall towers, big roads, um, very influential country on the planet these days. And they've seen that. And as a result, they buy that China dream. They drink the Kool-Aid. And the way they behave is quite conforming. So you see the products they buy are much more mainstream. They're the type of consumers Beijing would love everyone to be. But you fast forward 10 years later and you have the post-90s. And these guys, they're still very patriotic and things, but a lot of them are very, a lot of their um, directions and influences comes from overseas, overseas popular culture. A lot of them have studied overseas, much more likely to, or their friends have and they've lived vicariously through it. So they're very aware. Some of them will spend an awful lot of money. They'll, they'll study hard for their Gaokao exams. A lot of them will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to study in America. They'll come back to China and they may be lucky if they earn $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month in a city like Shanghai. And they're like, this China dream, what's it all about? I've been sold this China where this incredibly wealthy country and I'm making about a tenth of what I could be making if I'd stayed in New York. Um, so they're a lot more questioning. But they also, the way they purchase, the way they go on holiday, it's much more independent. So the way they get street cred or status is by buying brands and products that are much less common, much less mainstream. So they don't want that Louis Vuitton... Um, handbag that their mum used to carry around proud as punch. They don't want that black Rolex that their dad had. They, they want things that are much more independent, much more undiscovered. And as a result, they, uh, they buy more edgy brands, more niche brands. Similarly, where they go on holiday. They obviously get the snap in front of the Eiffel Tower, in front of the Sydney Opera House, but they're much more likely to want to go to those off-the-beaten-trail because that builds in street cred. They'll share it on their short video, on their WeChat moments, and they'll be much more likely to get kudos from their friends because they haven't done what everyone else has done these days. But then fast forward five years and you've got to change even more, and that's something we're seeing as more of these tribes happening. So these guys are much more comfortable in the way that they approach life. They're, they're not traditional. They don't operate in the way that Beijing would like them to. An example would be this really effeminate group or what Beijing refers to as sissy boys. So you're getting all these um, group sets of young men in China that are wearing makeup, wearing platform shoes, wearing the top selling term on Taobao, which is a big e-commerce platform for men searching for, uh, searching for fashion the fastest growing terms are lacy, see-through, all these things that 
typically you wouldn't suspect a, a, the average man to be, to be buying, but you're getting these kids that are confident in themselves, they've found a group that they're comfortable with, and they're expressing themselves. So very important to really understand that, that their groups and what's important. And, but something about these guys, if you compare, I'm sorry I don't have New Zealand, but if you compare post-95s or Gen Zs in America or the UK, they account for about 4% of household expenditure. In China, they're up over 15%. Most of them have never earned a dime, but they're still, uh, they have parents that are very supportive and, and, and they'll, uh, they'll support their needs um, from a purchasing standpoint. But one thing they all have in common is they've grown up, they're the only child generation, particularly in the cities, they are one child. So if you look at a city like Shanghai, where, I, where China Skinny's based, and you have 25 million people, but only 11 million of those people are Shanghainese. So they have what's called a hukou. Otherwise, they're migrants, mostly internal migrants from the poorer provinces that will come in and, and do, do a lot of the menial tasks, but, but often white-collar tasks as well. But that 11 million people are uh, advantaged quite a lot over, over the other people in the city. They own pretty much all the property. They uh, have better access to health care, education, those types of things. So you've got 11 million people own all the property for 25 million people, pretty much. So on average, each household owns more than two houses per household. And that's on average. So it's not unusual to own five, six houses. And 80% of, of Chinese homes are mortgage-free, or, or mortgage-free. A lot of the money comes from friends and family and things, but officially mortgage-free. So you have one child who has a mum and a dad. It's not unusual for them to own six six property, six apartments worth on average over a million dollars US freehold. So that's six million dollars you stand to inherit. Plus you've got two sets of grandparents. So you've got mum, dad, two sets of grandparents, let's say they've got six apartments each as well. Eighteen million dollars and I'm the sole heir to inherit that. This is not unusual folks. And then you've got another Shanghainese, a pretty wee girl. And Shanghainese will generally marry Shanghainese of a similar socioeconomic standing. Beijingers will be the same, a lot of these cities. So you've got someone that stands to inherit 18 million, and they'll marry someone that stands to inherit a similar amount. So between them, they've got this wee nest egg that could be $35 million worth of property in today's money. And so if you're only making one or $2,000 a month, as a lot of these Shanghainese kids are, why on earth would you bother saving that? If you look back to, to China historically, they have been the world's best savers. They're famous for saving. You'd go into households and look under the mattress, there'd be a stack of Rambos, a stack of red hundred quai bills under the mattress. Now, obviously, it's all mobile payments, but now they're not saving because they've never had... These young guys have never had a rainy day. They've never had austere times that their older generations have. So they're not saving what they earn. Most of them are living at home, so they don't have a lot of expenses. So everything they earn is going on discretionary purchases, hedonistic things. But not only that, but they're actually going into debt. Who cares when you're only making two grand a month but you stand to inherit? Why not go into a bit of debt? So they're going to debt at unprecedented rates. Between 2015 to 2017, consumer debt grew 500% in China unprecedented globally, but it's the, the 24 to 35 age group accounted for 70% of that debt. So it's these young guys that are really driving that debt. Now, I grew up on the mean streets of Lower Hutt, and I thought it was the centre of the world at the time, and uh, then I ended up in China, and I realised how small New Zealand is as a whole. Does anyone want to guess, and I've, this is a stat I love to use, so some people may have heard it before, but how many cities have more people than China, than New Zealand? So? In the suspense. 109. Prefecture level cities. And it's phenomenal just how many of these cities, most people in China haven't even heard of a lot of these cities, but, but it's, people will come into China and they will localise, as I said at the start, they will localise for China but it'll be this one homogenous strategy. People know, everyone talks about China being like Europe, it's so diverse from region to region. 
But then they'll go and have this generic approach for Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and it's all, all the same. But if you look at a city like Shanghai, 25 million people, it's got the same amount of people as Australia. It's got a GDP of more than the United Arab Emirates or more than Thailand, which you'd probably localise for. It's got a purchase power parity similar to Switzerland, so incredibly wealthy per capita. But that on itself justifies an element of localization. But again, it's, it's not, um, people aren't really localizing in the same way as they possibly could be. So you look at Beijing, another tier one city, completely different place. Its food tastes are quite different, lifestyle is completely different. The weather, it's really cold and dry versus down south, it's very hot and well, subtropical and less polluted. So skincare brands might need a different uh, formulation for the, for the hot, dry, polluted than the cold, uh, or sorry, the humid, less polluted south. Food tastes are completely different. Because of the weather's different, lifestyles are different. The types of sports people do, what they, uh, what they do for fun on the weekend. But even things like um, the emotional things are quite different. So in Beijing, the men, uh, the people are very nationalistic. Um, and we found that we're doing research for Sayak Motors, it's the biggest car company in China. We found that they're much more likely to want to buy a Chinese car in the north than they are down south. Much more proud of China and nationalistic as, as for brands. But then the men are much more macho. It's in Shanghai, the men are famous for carrying handbags. So if you and they do the cooking and the cleaning. So if you're selling food cooking type products, you might have a different marketing campaign in Shanghai versus Beijing. Um, people like in Beijing are about that much taller than they are down in, down in uh, Guangzhou. Um, and they're also fatter. 25% uh, of the population is obese uh, or overweight in Beijing versus about 12.5% nationally. But then there's two cities down south that everyone kind of lumps together, Shenzhen and Guangzhou. And you have these two cities that are both tier one cities, both incredibly wealthy and both buying a lot of stuff. But if you look at things like the language, in, in Guangzhou, it's an old city. The majority of the population there is from Guangzhou, so they speak Cantonese. Whereas Shenzhen, back in 79 when China opened up, it was a fishing village. So people have come en masse from all over China. The common language that brings them together is Cantonese, uh, sorry, is Mandarin. So two different languages, that's the surface stuff. But if you look at something like family bonding, which is incredibly important, you see it in so many Chinese ads, they have all this family messaging, family holidays for tourism, family food and dinners and all that type of stuff. Quite different uh, the way families are made up. So Guangzhou, people live with their parents. These millennials live with their parents, they see them every night or weekly. Whereas Shenzhen, their parents live in another city or another village. So they will only see their parents every month or maybe even once a year at the, at the Chinese New Year, Spring Festival. So the way you want to communicate can often be quite different. And there are two cities, two tier one cities, less than an hour apart in the fast train. And that's just the tier one cities. If you look at the lower tier cities, all completely different. Um, so worth a little bit of thought to just making sure that your products are relevant and resonant with those consumers in that particular city. This city here is, is a tier five city out in Anhui province. It's called uh, Tongling, and it's, uh, it's, it's only a mere 1.7 million people. But it doesn't really get a dot on the weather map. It's not a, an important city at all. But we were out there, a skinny team had a trip out there. We went into a supermarket, and there was rows of bread and, um, and biscuits and cheese and imported wine and whiskey and all these things, olive oil, you wouldn't have seen a few years ago. You're starting to get it out in these tier five cities. So you're starting to get all these all these cities that are that are really coming on board buying imported products. Um, we found that that well, sorry, we're looking at some data recently, and half of all uh, new affluent and middle middle income consumers are coming from these cities outside the top hundred. So even smaller than New Zealand. So there's a lot of growth in these cities, but again, an element of localization required. Uh, and, and again, talking about uh, tourism and how it can really benefit a lot of the other categories, um, if you look at these, these 
direct air, co air connections between Thailand and China. It grew from, sorry, I can't even see it properly, but it grew from about, I think it was 69 to 145 or something, correct me if I'm wrong, between 2015 to 2017. And so that's meaning more and more of these Chinese, one, can afford to travel abroad from these, from these lower tier cities, but they're going to places like Thailand and Korea and Japan, and, and that's wetting their appetite. And then they want to go f further afield. They want to go to places like New Zealand that are more exotic, give them more status. And as a result, we'll, we'll come here and more in mass and buy more of our products. It's all really positive in these different cities. Now, I'm going to just finish off here with uh, a, a small milk analogy. Obviously, this, I could do this for almost every product category, but milk, I did a milk run around the streets of Lower Hutt for about seven years when I was a little boy, back when we had bottles. And obviously, in, being in New Zealand, dairy is very important. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the melamine scandal 10 years ago, and they talk about China changing so fast and trends and consumer preferences. Something that still comes up when we talk to consumers is melamine, just although it's a decade on. And it comes up, and, and Fonterra today was talking about how there's this perception that, that foreign dairy is much better, and it definitely is. It's perceived as better, and, and all our research would say that. So we have some tools at the Skinny that analyse a lot of online data and scrape the internet and then analyse things like price distribution and formats and things like that. And we're doing some work for a dairy brand. And we looked at the price of um, domestic milk versus international milk. So with imported milk being almost 12 quai a litre, do you guys want to guess how much you pay for domestic milk based on the perception that, that local stuff's um, not as good? Oh, in the suspense. 16 quai. So it's 34% more for domestic dairy than it is for imported dairy. We're scratching our heads saying, we've got to do the analysis again. Something's not right here. We did it again. We did it again. And it kept coming out the same. And we're like, what on earth is going wrong? I thought everyone loved imported milk and was prepared to pay a premium for it. Then you look at the way Chinese drink milk. And they don't have this big container in the fridge in the way we do. They don't drink milk and buy the gulp it down by the glass. They have much smaller portions. They don't drink it by habit. They don't, most of them don't even really like milk, but uh, they, they drink a little bit of it. But the thing is, most brands, most foreign brands will come to China and they'll go into a supermarket or they'll go into a, an e-commerce store and they'll look and they look at all the imported brands and they're all one litre Tetra packs. Everyone's selling one litre Tetra packs. So like, yeah, we've got to sell one litre Tetra packs. What they're all doing. If you look online, 98% of all import, all one litre tetra packs or one litre portion size are foreign imported milk. But Chinese don't like these big bricks in the fridge. A lot of them don't even have it in the fridge. They have it on the cupboard. The minute you open that tetra pack, it's no longer fresh. Even if it's UHT, it starts oxidising. It's not really that healthy anymore. People like fresh on opening. So the Chinese brands get Chinese consumers a lot more and they're realising, yeah, we've got we to give smaller portions. One, they're convenient, fresh on opening. Young millennial white-collar workers want to carry them around in their handbags. So much more emphasis on the smaller portion sizes for these, for these local brands. You can charge a premium for a smaller portion size. So really important. Another thing is, again, the foreign brands come in and they sell these one-litre Tetra packs, plain white milk. So if you look at plain white milk, 70% of it is, is by the foreigners. But Chinese, not a huge fan of milk. I need a really good reason to drink milk. So the local guys have come in and they're like really segmenting out their market rather than this generic one-size-fits-all, yeah, it's the same for every one of you 1.4 billion people. Chinese guys come in and they do it really well and they say, OK, we know that parents are really into their children, so they've got special milk for brain development. They've got special milk for bone development. They've got special milk that helps babies sleep or kids sleep. They've got millennial gym go, high protein milk. They've got help your joints milk for, uh, for the oldies. All these different um, segmentation, targeted milk that just really resonates with consumers because they are used to having people showing them a little more love rather than this generic stuff. Value-added serves chocolate milk or flavoured milk. Walnut flavoured milk that's good for your brains because it's shaped like walnuts. 
all these wacky things, drinking yogurt. Bigger than drinking dairy, drinking milk now as a, as a category, but these local brands have been all over it, whereas foreign brands have not used their advantage of perception that dairy is better and haven't really, haven't really taken advantage. But this could be for any ca category, from fashion to cars. There's all these uh, advantages and really understanding the consumers and their differences and, and not just trying to take what may work in, in New Zealand or wherever else and thinking it will be the same in the China market. But I'm running out of time. Do I have a little bit of time? Or two minutes. Okay, my favourite category of all, and you've heard a little bit about hermafresh and that. I'm going to step it back a bit. There was a guy in, Ch in Ch uh, Chengdu in the western city, and he was a successful entrepreneur a good, over a decade ago. And he'd go around people's expensive apartment complexes, and he'd roll up his sleeves, and he'd dive into their rubbish and look through all their rubbish and, and look at all the packages, all the thrown out packages. And he'd say, hmm, I've seen a lot of this New Zealand honey. I've seen a lot of this Anchor milk. And he'd figure out what he's seeing a lot of. And then he'd build a little shop right next to the apartment complex. And he'd put on New Zealand honey, Anchor milk, all this type of stuff. And really good targeted. He knew these affluent people living next door would come and buy it. And he did it in quite a few apartment complexes. It's very successful. Fast forward a few years later and there's a company called Alibaba. And they have about two-thirds of, of, of the market for e-commerce, which is obviously 20% of retail. So every time someone gets something, buys something online and get it sent to their house, they know that this neighbourhood are buying a lot of New Zealand honey, this neighbourhood are buying a lot of New Zealand milk. And then they look at things like Alipay, which just about everyone who's buying anything in China these days is using their phone, either Alipay or WeChat Pay. So they know that everyone shopping in this proximity is buying with their phone an awful lot of New Zealand apples or New Zealand beef jerky or whatever it is going to be. And, and these Hermas stores are, are really kind of, they're all fun to use and all funky and great experience, but the reality is they're much better targeted to, they use big data and they're really targeted and focused. They uh, have tied in delivery. So now 60% of all sales for Herma goes through their app. So people aren't even going to the store for this new retail experience. They're actually buying it direct from their app because they know it, they trust it, they know the Fonterra milk's going to be fresh. And if you look at the average Herma store, or um, an established Herma store, they make about three and a half times per square metre than a normal supermarket in China. So due to this data and due to this really well-aligned um, targeting, they get much more specific uh, or much more profitable. And so just a really interesting area to look at. And we just, China Skinny just did the uh, Australian Business Sentiment Survey with the Australian Chamber of Commerce. And a couple of hundred, a little over 200 respondents, 50 of them were using new retail in some way, which surprised me how many there were, because it wasn't just food and beverage businesses. So people, are, brands, exporters are starting to get into it. You can really hone in on, on some of those great categories. Things like fresh are really popular. We're working with McCain, and we said, uh, we've got these frozen chips. Can we get some of those in your freezers? And they, I, I know the Hermar guys pretty well, and I was asking them that, and they were like, mm -mm, we're actually pulling a lot of these freezers out because people don't want frozen stuff anymore. It's not healthy, it's not fresh and clean. Whereas when we, we'd been going into people's freezers and looking at these tiny ice boxes, opening them up, and they've got like freezer burn dumplings. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Why would people muck around with frozen stuff when they can just go on their Hermar app and get it delivered in 30 minutes for fresh? So you more and more, and you see it, a lot of the fresh stuff going up to New Zealand, there's a real movement with this new retail with fresh and stuff like that. Sorry, I've gone over time. I could, I could blabber all day, but... Um. No, that's, uh, that's fine. Really interesting um, talk there. Uh, we, we don't, unfortunately, have any uh, time for questions from the floor, but um, I know that, Mark, you're going to be hanging around all, all day, and you'll be here in the break and the networking drinks afterwards. I did just want to... It looks like there's been a few questions there, and I wanted to touch on this whole notion of um, shopping in China being a bit more of a lifestyle than a chore over there. And I wondered how important it is, in particular, for New Zealand brands to embrace those entertainment channels that we've seen emerge, um, things like influencers, live streaming and gamification, particularly around Singles Day in November. Um, how important is that for, especially those food and beverage? Uh, yeah, it's, it's massive. Food and beverage is a good example. If you look, I don't have New Zealand, unfortunately. I'm guessing it's even lower than America and, and the UK. 
But if you look at America and UK, about 11, 10 to 11 percent of all their advertising has some kind of celebrity or influencer in it for FMCG. You look in China, it's up over 50 percent. So there's a real um, way people people really take note. And when you look, China is just full of new products coming in every day, hundreds of new products coming in every day. And the way that you can really get noticed is by having these recognised, recognisable celebrities, key opinion leaders, to really endorse your products. Mm. There's good ways and bad ways of using them. But I'll have to talk to you in the break. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Thanks, um, Tim. Cheers.